among the people that I met who've been diagnosed with cancer, um, I noticed one pattern. They are stuck in some kind of a relationship, some kind of a situation. I, it can be a relationship to their spouse, their mother-in-law, their, um, you know, their bank. They might have debts that they feel they are not able to pay, right? Like, like overwhelming situation, emotional discomfort. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, when I met Evita, I, I saw the video. She has a video, actually. One day, you were driving with Alison, the girl with the red background. And for ah, Evita hired Alison to do a video for her. And when they were driving, Evita tells Alison, "By the way, you know that I healed myself from ovarian cancer." <gasps> what? And this is the girl who lost both parents to cancer. So Alison did an interview to Evita about her journey, her story, and that interview went crazy, viral on the internet. In one blog of one friend in Australia has hundreds of thousands of views, a lot of controversy because people don't believe it. And I, I mean, you can believe it. Now, and that's the way I met Evita. Since I am doing internet marketing, I, I was very interested in her story. I was working in the cancer clinic. And that's the way we met through, through the internet. Why did you happen to write this book? Because I read this book, and this book is not just for people with cancer. Believe me, there is information from anybody, anybody and any st stage uh, can take it. Why did you have the idea to... To write yeah. the book. The main, um, the main purpose of this book is actually cancer prevention because I believe that um, it's very hard to reach into somebody's mind once they've been diagnosed, once they've heard the news from the doctor. Okay? Yeah. So on one hand I would like to invite everyone to, to look at cancer without fear. However, the fear is so prevalent when, once people have been diagnosed that it's so key that we would consider cancer prevention. And majority of humanity, most of us in the world, have not been diagnosed yet, right? So we are fear-free. And that fear-free uh, attitude sometimes translates into being careless, right? It's almost like, why do I have to change anything about my diet? Why do I have to look at my relationships? You know, why do I have to exercise and so on, take responsibility now when I'm still okay? I'm still doing okay, right? So I would like to challenge you to step into stunning health, into stunning fitness, and into leadership for your communities, for your friends. Be a shining beacon of, a, you know, shi shining beacon of light that 100% of health is possible and it's our birthright. Mm -hmm. You're talking about health, but I don't think that physical health is everything. Oh, absolutely not. For me, health is, is all areas of our life. That's the definition. We are not only a body. You are not your body. Your, your body is a temple of your spirit. And even the Bible says you need to take care of the temple, right? So what do you do to take care of the temple? You keep it clean. Mm -hmm. Right? You, you keep it beautiful. You, you, you make sure that there's music there, that there's joy. I have not yet met somebody who would have cancer who was very, very joyful. All right? But I have met a lot of people who, who had cancer who are, who are very, um, like, who are not able to forgive something, for example, who are holding grudge. I have not yet seen a super healthy, vibrantly healthy person who would hold grudge about something, right? So it's, it's not only our body, but it's, it's we are, a, we human beings have not really discovered yet who we truly are. I would rather say that we have completely forgotten that. And we are searching for identity. So here, you know, sometimes I can see that people, when they get their diagnosis, when they find out that oh, they, they have cancer, they become a cancer patient, right? So they have a diagnosis. 
So in, in the process of my healing, I have never called myself a cancer patient. I actually caught myself on this. I've never ever had an attitude or, or I never Me bought too. into that identity that I'm a cancer patient. Maybe because I was very lucky to be diagnosed differently. Well, that's my next question. You were diagnosed in a very unusual way. What happened? Yes, I was so, so blessed and so lucky that the first person that to told me about my health condition was not a medical doctor, okay? Probably if, if that was a doctor, I would be again in a state of fear and I would obey the instructions, right? Um, it was the year 2000, the new year, and it was the New Year's Eve. And my former husband and I, we were celebrating th at the party together with friends in southern Poland. So you can imagine, um, you know, fireworks go on, like, you know, Beijing, Sydney, then LA, New York, right? And then Paris and so on. I hope I'm saying that in the right sequence. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so uh, we were all very excited and you could really feel the momentum around the earth. Right, that we are evolving into a global community. So we, everybody was excited, and in the same time, there was a there was a lady at that party, and I I kept I noticed her immediately. She was very, she she the way she carried herself was very noble. She she would sit straight. She ate in moderation. She she, she there was just something very noble about her being. She turned out to be a healer. She turned out to be a chiropractor and an intuitive healer, psychic, shaman. I don't really know exactly what kind of capacity she had because I never met her after that, ex after that meeting. So she was like a messenger that you know, appeared at the right time, delivered the message to me. What happened was that she approached me and she said, I feel that you are in pain. I feel that your back hurts and you know, I'm a chiropractor. If you would like, we can go upstairs and I can adjust your spine, okay? So basically that's what she kind of offered in a brief conversation, right? She stood for me, she stood for my health. So um, we went upstairs and I, I was excited. I, I kind of wanted to become a friend. I kind of wanted to become friends with her, yeah? She adjusted my spine professionally, and then she, she scanned my body and she said, you have 16 gallbladder stones on your liver. And back then, I didn't have a clue where the liver was. <laughs> okay, that's how, that's how I, ignorant in oblivion I was of, of my body, my own body. And then she scanned uh, more and she said, uh, your pancreas is completely out of balance. Um, and I made these big eyes like, pancreas, where is that? <laughs> you know? And then she said, you know, it's, do you have those symptoms that, uh, do, do you have this that twice a day you crush like around 11 o'clock, 3.30, 4 o'clock, you just, you know, if you don't eat something sweet, you're about to faint. I'm like, yeah. So she said, that's pancreas. Yeah, that's pre-diabetic condition. If you don't take care of that, you, you might end up the, with diabetes, yeah? And actually many people have that condition, it's called hypoglycemia, and it's really like forerunner of diabetes. So I kind of, I kind of understood, yeah, that makes sense. And then she, then she went lower with her sonar vision, like a dolphin, and she said, and you have something serious going on on your reproductive organs. Go to the doctors and get tested, okay? So that was the woman that sent me to the, to, you know, to, to, to actually get, get a checkup. Yes. Back then I was 183 pounds. I, and it was kind of for years like this. Okay. Ever since I, ever since I entered grade school, I put on weight and I was a plumpy, chubby girl that sucked at sports. Um, and that, you know, I, I never, I didn't have a boyfriend in high school and I wasn't a high school sweetheart. Yes. Let's put it that way. I mean, I had pimples on my face, pimples on my back. There was like so many things going wrong and complexes and shyness and so on. I was still an outgoing person because I had to make up for that. However, I, deep inside, I felt very unloved. Yes. And what happened was that I did, th this lady, this Ukrainian lady, her name was Nadia. She actually made me take notes. 
Hey, she handed a piece of paper and pen and she said, take notes. You're going to do a cleanse. You're going to go fasting and you won't stop until those 16 gallstones come out. You will need to count them. So it's like fasting, like as if not eating. <laughs> uh-uh, that ain't gonna happen. So from that moment, I already, knew, I, I, I decided the woman was crazy, okay? And I was taking notes out of politeness. Okay, okay, whatever. I cannot wait to go down there to that party. I'm not gonna do any fasting. Then she mentioned coffee and a mask. And I was, I, I was thinking, yeah, that she's totally mad. She's, she's nuts. Okay, I, I kept on, I kept on taking notes, at, out of polite, politeness. I was addicted to fast food. Okay, so I could not imagine fasting as in, as it, you know, in non-eating for like le, for more than an hour or like two hours. Okay, she talked about three days minimum. All right, that didn't sound like fun at all. All right, and they had a fun party downstairs, you know, about to like Paris was about to go to June, Happy New Year, right? 2000. So um, what happened was that this lady told me about, she basically transferred to me a, a detox process, a process to purge my body out of toxins. And also she said to me about, she spoke to me about forgiveness and making sure my relationships are clear surround myself with people that, that contribute joy to my life and expand my freedom and that also receive who I truly am in, inside, inside my being. So, you know, I, and part of it made sense. The only thing I decided to take it take seriously out of that, I decided, okay, I'm gonna do myself a favor. I'll, I'll go, go get a checkup with the doctors, mm -hmm. okay? Because I really felt bad. But the, time, the day when she met me, I was, you know, not only I was overweight, I was very often very tired and depressed. And um, also I had blackouts, like there were moments when just the whole world just became black, like for a split second. Um, headaches and, you know, constipation and just that inflammation. Just, just, you know, I felt like something is just like eating on me inside. Yes, whatever that was. And, um, and of course I was very, very sick. Ever since childhood, I was very often sick and, you know, lots of mucus and always problems. So, um, so what happened was that I, when I returned back to, um, back to Warsaw, which was my home then, I went to the doctors, okay, and I, I got, uh, you know, a regular checkup. They, they were doing an ultrasound and basically they yelled at me. They said, oh my gosh, you have two more like cauliflowers. Okay, why don't you show up here regularly, yes? And back then, I was in a very toxic relationship. I was married for three years, and every, every single day I heard, I was told that I was stupid, <laughs> okay? So it was kind of sad, and, and, and basically I was chronically unhappy. You see, for three years in a soup of guilt, blame, shame, and all these games and so on, right? That go on a lot of times when people are, are, are married in an, I call it, when, when people are unauthentic in a relationship, yes? I was doing my best to be a good wife and, you know, kind of fake it, like pretend it. And, and unfortunately, it was not honest, yeah? I wasn't honoring or expressing my true feelings. So what happened was that I went to the doctors, they said tumors, they said, oh my gosh, you have to come back yet tomorrow night, you know, we need to continue to do a test, you might have cancer. And on the way home already, I said, that lady said about enema? <laughs> okay, so I went to the pharmacy, I got myself an enema bag. All right, and then I spoke, I spoke with my husband then, and I said, you know, they say I might have cancer. And he said to me, oh, don't worry, you'll be fine. He completely ignored me back then, yes? But you know what? Ironically, because he did not make it special, okay? He, done, he did not feel sorry for me and he did not shower, a, you know, avalanche of love because I had cancer, okay? I realized, oh, nobody's gonna take care of me. Hmm, okay, I better take care of myself. Do you, do you see what I'm, what I'm saying here? Right. So I decided to step into 100% of ownership of my own life. 
right? And I, I remember that lady said to me, you are not, you're responsible, you are responsible for only one life, your own, okay? And 100%. So that's what I decided to do. I decided that from, from this time on, my life is not going to go, like, you know, when you grab, when, when you are in front of a spring in the mountains, you can catch water like this and allow it to come through, or you can catch water like that and really catch it and drink it, yes? So, um, so later on, next day I came back for the tests and I was uh, shopping more for organic produce. I went back to the, to, to the notes, okay? She wants me to get Granny Smith apple juice and fast on this. Oh my gosh, this is gonna be horrible, <laughs> yes? You know, uh, back then, uh, fast food was the symbol of freedom in my country. Mm -hmm. So you, you can imagine, you know, I grew up in communist Poland, borders were locked, we were not allowed to travel anywhere, there was hardly any food on the shelves, and, and so, so we dreamt about Coca-Cola. We were hypnotized, okay? We, we saw something, we heard, we saw some images, you know, some of our family members were living in America, so they would send us like pictures, you know, from McDonald's, whatever, we're like, look, look at this, look at the food they have, right? So when that was, when borders went down, fast food restaurants were the first ones that generously opened up, mm. all right? So, so people in my country, just like today, they do so in China, in India, you know, they, they, people enjoyed, everybody enjoyed fast food and, and all the quick fix kind of, you know, packaged food and so on. We were experimenting. Oh my gosh, look, you can, you can eat Chinese and Italian and everything is just so easy to make and fascinating, right? So, so, so fast food was very often in my menu and also sneaker bars and, and soda. Yeah, I was drinking about a liter of soda. Yeah, and it, it kept my mood. And when somebody was telling me that I should eat a salad, once, like once in a while, I was thinking, I, it was almost, almost at the back of my head, I wanted to tell them, listen, okay, food is the only fun I have in life. My marriage sucks, my work is boring. I was working as a legal interpreter back then. So, you know, it was tr tr very boring. So food is the only fun thing and you want to take it away from me and tell me to eat a salad? No way, right? So enjoyment is part of life and it's so important because when you actually cleanse and your taste buds clear and you start craving food that is healthy, then you can continue, right? Because then you're driven on, on the pleasure, on the yummy recipes and all the, you know, on the delight, you can continue. You're not feeling like you're restricting yourself. Yeah, so I did a three-day cleanse, exactly as this lady told me. And it's okay. here. Yes, it's described here. Mm -hmm. And it was the worst three days of my life. <laughs> okay, the, the most yucky time ever. Um, I had shudders, I was emotional up and down, I had I, I had fever and I was, I felt like my whole body was stinky. Um, I did enemas, uh, you know, I felt nauseous, extremely weak, sleepy, moody, or was just like the first day I didn't know why I was even doing this. But I was thinking, okay, I, you know, I don't want to go to the Polish hospital and get staph infection, <laughs> okay? So I better try this. You know, back then the news of staph infection in, uh, was all over the media and only former Communist Party members could afford a private clinic, which was kind of hygienic and so on, right? But even in an American hospital, you can get staph infection, so it's, you know, don't think you're safe from that. So the first day I didn't know even why I was doing this, okay? But I, I, con I continued. Second day I felt horrible and I wanted to quit, but she said to me, not until all the ghost stones come out, count them, so she actually told me to look in what's coming out of me and it was pretty stinky like sewage but I was glad that it's out I realized oh my gosh I've been walking with all this gunk inside me okay <laughs> and you know I wasn't aware right so it was just a tremendous release and and a journey of like of awareness like really I saw gallbladder stones come out I saw colon stones come out that looked like walnuts 
okay? I mean, it's like there's a lot of coming out, there's a lot of things that can be released, including different creatures like worms and parasites and so on, yes? I'm not going to be explicit, but you can, you can Google and see images, okay? <laughs> Evita, this is fascinating. I just wanted to, to read the titles of the chapters of her book. Chapter one, how marriage nearly killed me. <laughs> the next one, how a, f a psychic saved my life. How doctors nearly kill me. How I saved my life. So at this point, I, I want you to ask her any question that you may have. Like, for example, how long was the process until yes. you gain weight and you see results, the tumors on your ovaries or were reducing? Uh, how long, Repa how think long of was a the question. process until I lost weight? And yes. you went to the doctors and your tumors were... Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So basically... So, first I did a three-day cleanse and was purging. And as I said, it was the worst three days of my life. Then I came back. It was like maybe one day later, I came back for results. And I knew that the tests I did before were already irrelevant because so many things have changed in my body. I mean, imagine I lost seven pounds in three days. So something must have moved, right? <laughs> something must have been radically different. It was almost like, like an internal surgery in my body, okay? But it was still, it was very non-invasive and gentle. The body did it, yes? So, um, when I came back, I, I heard the doctors saying, we've said long faces, we're very sorry of cancer, you know, grab your pajamas and toothbrush and show up here next day at this hospital, yeah? And, you know, we're gonna do surgery, so if surgery doesn't help, we have chemo, radiation, and so on. And I entered the office with the attitude of like, I have to tell them what that woman told me. Maybe they'll tell their patients, right? So it was a little bit like, um, a Jehovah Witness trying to convert Hare Krishna. Yeah. Right? We, we obviously had different books, okay, and different agendas. <laughs> okay? So that didn't work very successful. <laughs> However, I would like to, for, for, for those of you who are, who are medical professionals and doctor, doctors, nurses, and scientists, I really would like to honor your, um, your courage to, to help humanity in this area and, and really take care of human bodies and human health. And I invite you to consider wellness, okay? To consider alternative solutions. There's a huge opportunity here for all humanity. Any questions? What role did uh, forgiveness uh, take in your healing? Huge, yes, huge. Uh, I'm going to repeat it. Yeah. What is the role that forgiveness took in your healing journey? Mm -hmm. So um, there comes a point after a while when you cleanse and detox your body through fasting that you become aware of what else do I need to let go of, right? That's not so tangible, not so visible, and it's also poison, okay? Buddha said unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping that someone else is gonna die. It isn't gonna happen. Right? Most of the time when we hold grudge, that person is not even aware of it. Or they don't care, they don't understand. Right? Every time when we are unforgiving, it creates acidic pH in our body, in our, in our body liquids, and cancer thrives in acidic environment. Right? So I realized, oh, I need to forgive and, and trans, uh, transform, transmute that relationship that I had with my husband. So today I'm, I'm super grateful. He woke me up. It was, it was a gift. Yes? And, and in your process of healing, radical forgiveness, not just forgiveness, not just like sweeping under the carpet like, you know, okay, you know, stuff happens, we can just forget it. Right? Radical forgiveness is when you are basically grateful that it happened. Where you turn the tables around and you find everything that doesn't kill you ultimately makes you stronger. So it's a gift. Yeah. Actually, one of the chapters says how to forgive radically. It's an amazing chapter for anybody. You don't even need to, to be sick, it's just to prevent sickness. Yeah. Carol, do you have a question, a metaphysic question? Well, I know, I am just saying anything, <laughs> anything you want. Well, you know, so how long did it take 
to cleanse your body and then simultaneously you're at the same time cleansing your, yourself emotionally are you also developing a metaphysical con consciousness or awareness mm -hmm. of spiritual <laughs> level so um it took me four months and after four months i was completely cancer free and um, i lost 83 pounds you need to remember one thing i didn't do surgery chemo radiation the only thing i did was coffee in the mass fasting and i ate a lot of fruit and and all the, the spiritual and emotional yes healing. and and another and um, a big aspect of my healing a critical aspect was that i decided to leave the toxic relationship and i decided to vote with my feet okay and reclaim my life reclaim my freedom reclaim my my sanity yes and today i i see a lot of times people um, people decide to cleanse and heal on a physical level and then they reach a plateau when they 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 cannot really fully step into like vibrant health and then that's the moment when we look at their relationships and aha uh -huh, we see that they don't want to they don't want to become authentic with someone like really say authentically what they really feel or or what they misunderstood how they judge somebody they don't want to take responsibility and ownership of some kind of a story that they've been living in I consider that there's two different things there are facts so this, this stuff happens in our life and there's the way we interpret this what we made it to mean about ourselves about life yes and here this that, that story that interpretation a lot of times is totally inaccurate yeah? so so um, many times when people contact me with uh, with cancer um, a lot of women across the world message me because they've been diagnosed with ovarian cancer or uterus or breast cancer whatever and it's very interesting to notice virtually every single woman that has been diagnosed with reproductive system reproductive cancer including myself has been molested sexually in childhood right so there is stuff to forgive right and stuff to really like look at it there is fact it happened what have i made it to mean about me about the possibilities in my life what possibilities have i shut down okay and and decided that i don't deserve or i cannot be my true self because something happened yeah so um this, this is a very um, profound and, and crucial yes because we all have these interpretations and lives that are blocking us from moving forward oh yes absolutely yes me do you have a question please mm -hmm. jordan I, I have one just more on the physical aspect of the cleanse <coughs> yes um i recently also started doing coffee and it was and it's been great um how long did you do that for was it only three days or did you do it like daily or okay. more than daily? so first first i fasted just for three days and it was just just for me to get used to the physical process of it the rhythm of it and and remember that fasting is an ancient the oldest therapeutic method known to humanity okay there has been never anything more primal this is what animals do when animals want to want to heal themselves because they've been poisoned by something they fast they drink water they move and they fast they don't put next thing into into their mouth yes fasting is also incredibly spiritual and it opens you up to an, a realm of spiritual awareness and consciousness and that realm truly transforms your life it truly heals to be in the space of like oh i'm just bigger than the drama in my family oh i'm even bigger than my dreams you know what else is possible now in my life so once you heal physically once you kind of purge physically the next step is almost naturally you're, you want to examine your belief system right am i like let's say the beliefs that i had was that i'm fat and i'm stupid and i'm unattractive and nobody wants me nobody likes me and da 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 i cannot you know there was like the list goes on and on and on so i start the the paradox was that after i lost weight and healed soon after i was photographed by a modeling professional photo model, modeling uh, photographer 
And I still believed about myself that I was fat and stupid and inattractive and so on. So I realized this is some kind of an old software. Who told me this? How come I believe that? Yes? So it's almost like basic work is the work with belief system. Yes, all those limitations. So I started to push the edge. Okay, where else did I buy into a limiting limitation in my life? And I continue to push that edge because it's an incredible journey of like self express self express it's a journey of self expression. So many people are caught in this that story. Your work, I know by other people that you introduced me, have helped many women to wake up. Yes. And, and work on that blockages that, that they have, this story, that self-belief. I know that is hard, but can be done, right? right. Yes, we have, a, we have a, a program online. It's called Viva La Cleanse. And we also have a closed Facebook group where we support each other. It's not only open for women, it's open for everyone. And the stories are truly amazing. Like, I mean, this really keeps me going. Um, one lady from Seattle, Kathy Browns, she lost, she just posted recently, she visited her doctor, a rheumatologist, amazed, the inflammation is gone down, she lost 30 pounds within two months, her skin is glowing, and you, you know, the biggest thing is that what it does really to, our, to, to the human spirit, you feel like born again, you feel, you know, you have a new body, you're, you're, you're rejuvenated, you're glowing, right? Like uh, Steve is fasting today because Evita's uh, suggestions and, and teachings, right? Absolutely. And uh, it's, it's easier to fast when you know that there is a group that is being benefited by the same... It's great to have that group. Yeah. Any other question? Melanie? So, um, so you continue to do fasting as part of your regimen? Yes. Oh yeah, very much. Fasting is, is part of my lifestyle. And I would say that today I don't fast for healing from disease. I just love fasting. Once a week I'll do a, a maintenance fast. And it's for the clarity of my mind. Because you see, our colon, the, the Chinese medicine, right? In Chinese medicine they say, your colon is your second brain. <laughs> okay? So if you would like to have clarity of thoughts and, and clear intention, clear instincts in business, for example, intuition. You want to take care of your health, right? You want to take care of your colon. And um, fasting is very much part of leadership. So if you're interested in becoming, in, ha in having clear vision, clear guidance where you're going, fasting is key because it really removes everything, remo removes every blockage, every fear, and um, Look at this, every single leader on, in our history fasted. Jesus fasted, Muhammad fasted, Buddha fasted, every single warrior fasted. Alexander the Great, Chinggis Khan, every, every, you know, all the kings in, in, in times, pharaohs fasted, Cleopatra fasted, Lady Diana fasted, and, and she, she did cleanses many times, yes? So if you're thinking of how to play a bigger game in life, fasting is really cool. Yeah, it opens up chakras basically, yes, it opens up all this. Uh, by the way, I did Evita's fasting and cleansing a couple of times, one time for seven days, I was about two years ago. It was amazing. I was doing Reiki and my, the energy on, on the healing session was like amplified. And, uh, and the, the, the good thing of her method is drinking coconut juice. I always this fasting just with water or orange juice, but th this is a good food and you still can do the fasting yeah. and your brain is so sharp and alert that you want to do it again. So it's really amazing, yeah. really amazing. Yes, also when it comes to nutrition, I'm a big believer of simplicity. I know that there's a lot of you know, health gurus out there and many best-selling books and amazing things are written about what should human beings eat or not. I believe that common sense is key, yes? And we human beings are like primates. We're like apes, right? Whether we like it or not, some of us have a very similar smile. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and, and we also have similar hands. We have practically identical digestive system, right? And uh, we, 
our DNA is very similar, especially to bonobo monkeys, who've been recently discovered as the closest apes in terms of DNA to human beings. And we, I believe that we human beings should be watching carefully what do the apes eat, right? Because they, they have a lot of similarities. So far, human beings have been eating like vultures, like wolves, like tigers, right? They salivate. Those animals salivate when they see uh, a gazelle, a sheep, a cow, a chicken, right? We don't really salivate when, you, when we see animals on the field. So that should be like a common sense signal that probably that's not our food because our instinct is not really like turning, turning us on like go run and grab, you know, grab the leg and bite <laughs> and so on, right? So I believe that it's time for us to reclaim the Garden of Eden and consider eating a lot of fruit. Consider eating fruit. And every cancer patient that I've ever met, every person with diabetes, every person with different diseases that are there, candida, autoimmune disorder, whatever, they've been told to avoid fruit because fruit has sugar. Re I'm sorry to interrupt, but regarding that, Adam McLeod, this uh, healer and uh, naturopathic doctor I interview, regarding sugar, he says, the problem is when you eat the sugar of the candy because it's such amount that you cannot process, pre produce a spike on, on the blood, I don't remember exactly, but the fruit, you release that sugar, uh, but uh, gradually in a way that you can process yes. it. So that's not true that yes. the fruits are, are bad, right? That's right, that's right. Yeah. The, the key is if your body can absorb, okay? That's the question. If you are clogged up inside, you have like a layer of gunk and fat and stuff, you know, old proteins that are petrifying and rotting and old fats that are going rancid, you know, there's like, if you talk to a doctor who, who does VV section, after people die, they open the colon and they say, oh my gosh, it's like, like an old stove that has not been washed, you know, like the, the layer of, of stuff that's attached to the colon. So now no matter what, what juices we take, supplements, if we eat fruit, it doesn't get absorbed easily. Yes? So it ferments inside. But if you cleanse and detox and then you eat fruit, hoo-hoo, you have lots of energy, you absorb it in minutes and it contributes to your fitness. And ultimately for me, fruit works like coffee. I wake up in the morning, I have a watermelon. I'm awake. <laughs> so when you're thinking a question, if you could give our audience yes. one tip, some recipe, some thought, suggest you yes. for their healing journey, what would you tell them? Okay, so one tip. Remember you had so many, but. Yes. So the key message that I would like to say here, own your life. 100% and give it away. Give it to humanity. Mm. It's gonna bring you so much joy and healing and a sense of purpose that nothing, you will be unstoppable. Wow, that's fantastic. A lot of times when I, when I work as a coach with someone, as a transformational leader, and they've been diagnosed with cancer and they've had all sorts of stuff happening, you know, their story, right? I ask them, what has happened just before you were diagnosed? And they're like, why are you asking? It doesn't matter, right? What matters is, you know, when I heard the news. I'm like, tell me what happened? Nothing happened. Really, are you sure? Well, you know, I found out, one lady said, I found out that, um, you know, our father had children out of wedlock and those children inherited everything. Well, that sound, does that sound like nothing happened? <laughs> it's a shock, right? It's, a sh it's shocking news. And another thing, it's something to forgive. If you really want to live a help, he healthy life and happy life, you need to face it and you need to deal with this. Yeah? And um, you, it sounds like you need a conversation with your father. It sounds like you need a conversation with your whole family. Right? So um, I met, uh, among the people that I met who've been diagnosed with cancer, um, I noticed one pattern. They are stuck in some kind of a relationship, some kind of a situation, I, it can be a relationship to their spouse, their mother-in-law, their, um, you know, their bank. They might have debts that they feel they are not able to pay, right? Like, like overwhelming situation, emotional discomfort. Imagine you've been in a relationship with someone who has given you a lot and given you and given you and now you're kind of feeling like suffocating and you just want to spread the wings and, and be free. 
kind of difficult to say, you know, I'm leaving. Yeah, so a lot of times women, a lot of times people, when they are stuck in situations that are like unauthentic, they create cancer as a gateway because they would rather die than face it and be authentic and say, honey, I love you, however, I need to leave. Okay, they would rather die than live a life of poverty and self-responsibility to pay that debt, pay those debts and face their financial situation. We need to get it. You can have reasons or results. You cannot have both. So if you are stuck to your reasons, if you're stuck to your because, because of this, because and all the becauses, and if you're, you know, if you would like to really live a healthy life, but your husband doesn't eat healthy and, you know, it's, it's whatever, or your wife, what's the but? Do you own your life? Who owns your mouth? Who owns every word that you utter? Right? Your words create your reality. Yeah. So 100% of ownership of your life is just so vibrant. Yeah. And that 100% means also when you go, some people go to a doctor and the doctor tells them, this is what you have to do and, and, and there is no other option. Yeah. Do you have to follow blindly what somebody tells you or you have to own the the healing process that you need? Good question. Well, first of all, I would, I would look with my blondy common sense if the doctor is really healthy. Okay, that's one thing. Yeah, and I'm not going to listen to anybody who is not vibrantly healthy. Yes, many health gurus nowadays are extremely popular, preaching lots of different fancy theories and selling products and so on. However, you know, my attitude is like, okay, let's go running together. Tell me about it. Let's talk. This is really great, great theory. Okay, so that's that's like the barometer. Do not listen to people talking about health if they don't radiate health. Right? Common sense. Choose your mentors wisely. Yeah. And um, when it comes to all these different procedures that the medical community has to offer, I would research what is the effectiveness of chemotherapy, like statistically. Yes. And from my observation, a lot of people are lucky if they survive five years and a lot of, and then they are considered cancer survivors and past five years, they die like flies. And I met a lady in Honolulu one time. She was diagnosed, uh, she recently died. This, 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 this lovely Japanese lady, she recently died. She was diagnosed with breast cancer 30 years ago. And she refused, she refused this to be treated. She said, no, you know, it doesn't hurt me. Let's leave it alone, okay? If it's not broken, don't fix it. She didn't want any biopsy, nothing, okay? She lived with it for 30 years and she died at the age of 90 some years yeah. because she fell off a staircase, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so for me, cancer is an opportunity for us to really reclaim our health and transform, transform our lives. Step into ownership, clarity, and what if we could actually reshape the economy by our food choices, right? More and more people would buy organic food. That's why you call it the bliss of cancer. Yes. Yeah, yeah what, if, what, what else is possible? with cancer. We've been in the conversation of fear and trauma. I can see m people running marathons for, for cancer cure. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. What if we would have a marathon for health? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to run? <laughs> yeah. It's very important that you took it in that way, that cancer was a, an opportunity, because usually in this Western culture, you have cancer or you have a, a sickness or whatever, you feel guilty, you have something. But I met so many amazing women and some through you that they see this as, as an opportunity. I interviewed Jenny Ross, the owner of 118 Degrees, and she says, I mean, any health challenge is an opportunity. I didn't have that consciousness a few years ago. Always when there is crisis, there is an opportunity. The bigger the crisis, the bigger the opportunity. Right? Today in the world, we are facing a, a huge crisis when it comes to cancer, and it's going to increase. A lot of people are going to die unless we do something. Cancer thrives in, in, in 
cancer thrives in inflammation. Look, go at the beach in California, look how many people are inflamed. California used to be the, the place of, you know, bikini girls and all the fancy surfers and so on. Look how many people really look that way, yes? How deformed are our bodies? Like, without any shame, without any judgment of the body. Just acknowledge that something is profoundly off here. This is not how human beings should look like. This is not healthy. It's not as, do not, do not allow anyone to call you fat. You're not fat, you're inflamed. And you can change that. It's a health condition. Yeah. Any question? I have, um, uh, what suggestions would you make for um, approaching, um, like for example, if we have friends or loved ones that have cancer or are being di you know, in the process of being diagnosed or who have had it and are you know, working on treatment, what's, um, what are some good ways to sort of support open them, their eyes open their eyes, support them and help them to maybe be open to some of these Mm -hmm. um, these ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, I must admit it is very difficult. It's very difficult to have a meaningful, logical, rational, inspiring conversation with someone who's been diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. because people are in a state of fear. So number one thing when I, when I speak with someone I say what if you would remove fear out of this situation for a moment, you can put it back later. <laughs> but what if you would have no fear? What would you consider? Yes, so help them to see it, look at it without fear, with courage, with faith, with, with possibility. Yeah? Another thing I strongly recommend that people who have been diagnosed should look into their emotional issue. Yes, a lot of times it's a story from childhood. Yes? So for example, Landmark Forum is great at looking at that story and separating meaning that they created from facts that really, really happened, yeah? And it's, it can be very empowering for them. It can be like a new chapter in life. Yeah? So they quit, they quit feeling sorry for themselves. Because the, the thing is that once people ha are diagnosed, okay, once you're diagnosed, you start feeling special, <laughs> okay? And you start feeling sorry for yourself. Am I correct? Right. Uh, and besides that, it's a big trauma. Yeah, and also it's a, it's a trauma. So you feel, you feel paralyzed. And in the same time, a lot of times family surrounds you with cookies and chocolates and they bring flowers to the hospital. And, and you know, so all of a sudden you're sick and you get all this love. Mm -hmm. Wow, cool, maybe I should stay sick for a couple of years because they didn't love me before. Yeah, so there's added benefits. Yeah. And, and I know that it's very controversial what I'm saying, but if you want to heal, you need to quit begging for love from outside. You start shining it, start, start being love and shining it out. There's really nothing, nothing to grab, nothing to take from other people. There's just everything you need is inside you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Evita. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, for holding the space for this and yeah, the really energy. Different. Yeah, it was really different, right? No, 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 don't take it. Huh? I, I wanted to say something. Don't stop recording, okay? Organizing this summit is a lot of work. We have been working for over four months. I have the support of Jan, invaluable support in, in, in tough times. Richard recording all these videos, doing this uh, interview. But I, I want to recognize someone who <laughs> has been very invaluable on this work. Come. This can be. Okay, this lady, this lady is an angel that came, I don't know, six, seven, eight months ago. She knows everything on the website. She edits every video. She goes ahead of the game. Many times I ask, eh, eh, Brian, we have to do that. Oh, I did it. <laughs> so things that I never taught her. She is amazing. I really thank you so much. Thank you. you are really mm -hmm. the core of this summit. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Wow. Um, and don't even don't th even think about it. She's not for hire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was my thought, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <Stop> <laughs> no, we are going to grow.
Okay, that was fantastic. So cool. And awesome. That, I mean, it, it was thank an you. incredible interview. So thank you. Oh, so you everyone, have we books. have my book. Okay.